It is very doubtful that in your great big network or even your smaller little network that you're only going to have one switch, right? You're generally going to have multiple switches in a network. So we better have some way for them to send traffic to each other. And that's what a trunk is all about. All a trunk is, is this. It is a physical connection between two switches. That's it. And remember the theory of this is that we need a crossover cable for that because we're connecting two like devices. But we know in the real world that most switches will be able to take a non-crossover cable and say, okay, okay, I know what you're doing. Let me adjust to that. And the trunk comes up. But again, for our theory and for our CSENT and CCNA exams, we need a crossover cable for that trunk. Now, what happens here is that as a switch is going to send a frame across the trunk, it tags this frame. It inserts a VLAN ID into it that identifies the VLAN. Yeah, I know. But it, it, that's what it does. It identifies the VLAN to the remote switch. So, And we call that frame tagging, by the way. So what would happen here is if both of these hosts were in VLAN 10, if the switch on the left were sending a frame to the switch on the right, then before it sent the frame across the trunk, it would insert this tag, VLAN 10. And when the receiving switch gets that frame, it looks in that ID field and said, OK, I need to forward this to devices that are in VLAN 10. And that helps us avoid that broadcast behavior we'd have otherwise. Because if we didn't have that, a switch receiving a frame from another switch would just have to say, you know what, I want to make sure this gets to everybody. It has to, so I'm just going to send it to everybody. That's what we want to avoid, and that's what trunking helps us avoid. Because again, it allows VLAN traffic to flow from one switch to the next, but at the same time it prevents frames from being sent to hosts that don't need them or don't want them. Now the trunking, again it consists of two trunking ports and a crossover cable. Of course our PCs are connected access ports with a straight through cable. Now there are two major protocols used to create trunks between Cisco switches. So we know any situation like that that's very fertile ground for an exam question or several exam questions. The interesting thing is one of these, I wouldn't say it's phased out yet certainly, but it's actually going out to the point where newer Cisco switches don't even run it. And the odd thing is that's the Cisco proprietary trunking protocol that a lot of Cisco switches won't run. The 2950s that we've seen here in my videos and the 2960s that we've seen, uh, neither one of them use ISL. They won't run it. And that really threw me when I first got my home lab a, a long while back, or I bought these 2950 switches when they were new, actually, and started creating training videos. And I remember getting to that, and I'm like, why won't this run ISL? <laughs> and it turns out they have Cisco is doing that on purpose. You're about to see why, and just as you need to be clear on the TCP UDP differences and similarities, I would be just as clear on the differences and similarities between ISL and .1Q. Cisco proprietary, if it's the first time you've heard this term, uh, all that means is you can only run it on Cisco devices. And that's one problem with the inter-switch protocol ISL. Another problem is that the entire frame is encapsulated before it's transmitted across the trunk. And the reason that's bad is because of what its counterpart, IEEE 802.1Q, thankfully generally referred to as .1Q, that's the industry standard trunking protocol. And you'll hear these terms occasionally, Cisco proprietary versus industry standard. It just means Cisco proprietary can only run on Cisco devices. Industry standard can run on anybody's. Uh, if a non-Cisco switch is involved in the trunk, of course, that is the trunking protocol you would need to use. One big benefit of .1Q is that it does not encapsulate the entire frame. Instead, it just adds a four-byte header to the Ethernet header, uh, which indicates the VLAN to which the frame is intended. So that's the tag right there. So what's the one word we learned about this in TCP versus UDP? And we're talking about those, and we're showing all these great benefits of TCP. But what's the big reason that UDP is often preferred over TCP? Because it has less overhead, right? Overhead's a big word there. Well, overhead is a huge word here. Because with ISL, again, you're encapsulating every frame. So you're putting a header and a trailer on it and dot one Q the overhead is much less. There's another concept here, very important one, 
that I want to go, uh, go over with you. It's called the native VLAN. And this is another big difference between the two. By default, the native VLAN is VLAN 1. And all the native VLAN is, I've seen some really convoluted explanations of this over the years. It's just the default VLAN. And when dot one q is ready to transmit a frame destined for the native VLAN over the trunk, the protocol doesn't even put that little four byte header in. It just sends the frame. So this cuts down even more on overhead because then when a switch gets an untagged frame from another switch on a trunk, and you're running dot one q the switch says, oh, okay, there is no VLAN ID in here, therefore it's intended for the native VLAN. Nothing to it. Now, again, you can change that, uh, the native VLAN, that is, with dot one q You might want to do that, say, when 60% or even less, really, of your hosts are in one VLAN, and it doesn't happen to be VLAN 1. Let's say that these switches are uh, heavily used by the accounting department. You got a lot of accounting users, and way back when somebody made the accounting VLAN, VLAN 20. Well, if a good percentage of your traffic is in VLAN 20 on these switches, I would make VLAN 20 the native VLAN because that cuts down even further on your overhead when you're running dot one q Because here's another bummer about ISL. ISL doesn't even know what a native VLAN is. So we can't even cut back on the ISL overhead with the native VLAN concept because, again, ISL doesn't even know what it is. So that means that every single frame you send across an ISL trunk is going to be encapsulated. That is a lot of overhead. That's a lot of it. So let's go over those details real quickly, and then we're going to just talk about it for a few more minutes, and then we'll see some of these trunking protocols, or one of these trunking protocols, uh, in action on our switch. ISL, again, it's the Cisco proprietary trunking protocol. It encapsulates every frame before it goes across the trunk, and it does not recognize the native VLAN concept. Dot one q is the industry standard. It places only a 4-byte header onto a frame, and it won't even put that on there if the frame is destined for the native VLAN. Uh, as again, as I mentioned on the board, for these reasons, you'll see dot one q a lot more than ISL. And again, the 2950 and 2960 switches and other switch models that people like to use for home labs, uh, they don't even run ISL. So I would, I would not sweat that. I would just know that part that they're not going to run ISL. Now, I've mentioned these, uh, the access ports once or twice, but I, I really want to draw the line here between access ports and trunk ports. A Cisco switch port is going to be one or the other. It's going to be an access port or a trunk port. It cannot be both. An access port belongs to one and only one VLAN. And once you configure a port as an access port, it cannot become a trunk port. It cannot trunk. Now, trunk ports carry traffic for multiple VLANs. The default behavior of a trunk port is that it is a member of all VLANs. And let me show you one command here on the live equipment. Go ahead and jump in here. Let me line this up. Do, 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 do. Show VLAN brief. We've run this one a couple of times. And you can see here quickly, you know, it's a 12 switch port, and it's really easy to skip over the fact that 6 and 8 are not here. That's interesting, because here's default one, you know, here's our VLAN one, our native VLAN. It's our default VLAN. You see it's active. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now that's no problem because you would expect them to appear down here, you know, perhaps in another VLAN. But we've only created one additional VLAN, VLAN 45, and those ports are not in that particular VLAN. So where are they? They're probably trunking, and you can see them with show interface trunk. Very handy command. You can see here's port 6, here's port 8. Here's the encapsulation. We know what that is already, and that's 802.1q. We see that the status is trunking, and again, the native VLAN is always going to be 1 by default. Then we've got some other information down here about what VLANs are allowed on the trunk. Notice that by default, 1 through 4094 are allowed on both ports. 1 and 45 are allowed and active in the management domain. Spanning tree forwarding state and not pruned. We get, we get into this one in your ICND2 studies. we got enough going on up here. But under mode, 
you know, we've got a couple of different things going on here. One says desirable and one says on. Kind of sound like the same thing, right? I mean, if it's desirable, you know, maybe it should be running. But we'll get to that here in just a minute. But show interface trunk is a command you always want to run right after show VLAN brief. Because if you don't see ports here, see if they're the ones that are trunking. And if they are, well, by golly, then you know what they're doing. So let's see. We've got a couple of different modes here that I wanted to run past. Did we have any here? Here we go. So show interface trunk ran that. And I want to show you the trunking options. And the trunking options, we have quite a few. We actually have five unofficially, but they're not all visible in one place. So let's take a look at the switch port mode command. Actually, we're at the 11 minute mark on this video, and I don't want to interrupt this next part. So I'm going to stop the taping here. And when we come back, we're going to take a look at all of these options for our trunks. And while this is something that we don't exactly change on a daily basis. I really expect it to come and play on your exam. So we need to pay particular attention to that one and we'll hit it on the next video.